Zvezdnemu člena tovarstva, osoblevo v Italiju jeho v završenjem jeho najnovišo izveštitelji prači, profesora Jaroslava Rodnečkoho i jeho roli v vstanovljeni politike bahatokulturnosti v Kanadi. Jak može znajete, doktor Primah vdeža v menulogo roku naukovo stipendiju, naukovo tovarstva in Ševčenka na dosliđenja in napisanja stativi pro Jaroslava Rudnečko. Še hodni ve, in ja, očvedno, imate nemo nahodo počuti dopovit na temu čoho važnoho dosliđenja in najnovišo dosliđenja. Dopovit bude angliško imovnjo, diskusija o boh mojah. Koristajuče z nahodi, zaprošuju vših vas pri te na nastupnji naši dvi dopovidi. Herša se dopovid odnoho z moločih členjev tovarstva doktora Aleksandra Romanka na temu kanačko-ukrajinski ošvitnik na ukovih projekti, vekoristanja štučnovo intelektu ta analitike dla dizajnu ošvitnih program. Dopovid vid bude če v pjatniču, od 11. travnja, v hodini šomi treće, v večeri, v čomu premišči. Druga dopovid, se dopovid dr. Olje Benš z Slovačine na temu fenomen zanemki v školji kulture. Dopovid vid bude če v pjatniču, peršo od červnja, v tej šešno, v še najčetov roku, v hodini šomi treće, pred drebno v čomu premiščeni ob mel, ali za zadnju prošlošti kovate v našem kovidomenju. Na ki neč? Hoču zložiti podjaknu naši imprezovi referenči, pani Hristi Kolos, za organizaciju dopovidi in večera, a me mister do tanovi Kolosu za dopomogu. Osobljeno podjaka v Krinjškem kulturnem centru na ruke Holove, pani Darji Luči, ta fondacija Budučniš, na ruke Holove, pana Romana Mereka, za možno je više plaždovnjiva te dopovidi v čom premišljeni. Do predstavljanja šanovnoho dopovidača in prevedenja večera, ja poprošu disno od člena naukovo tovarjstva imene Ševčenka, profesora Amireta Univerziteta Jork, fizika in znavča istorije in moho čudnika, doktora Jurija Derevča, v ekipu, kolegi davno, studentom, profesora Rodnečkov v Inhleku. Prošu. Jako jo. Ja počnu taj moja družena. Za teh šo mene ne znaju, da je to razi. Meni je duže prijemno predstaviti vam nejišnjoho dopovidača Tomasa Primaka. Bo ja pročetal dekljika jeho knježok in oni na mene zrobili veliko vraženja iz tatej, ne tih knježok, in tomu je duže s povagu in ustavljali se do jeho naukovo in dijalne zbegove. Tomas Primak, ce je istorik in doslednik pre katedri Ukrajino znavstva, videli v istoriji ta političnih nauk v Torontojskom univerzitetu, je ponovino držal doktorat 1984. rok. Ja zadal to jo knjižke, ja hoču jih nazvati. Perša se je Mihajlo Hruševski, The Politics of National Culture, to je vedanje Torontonskega univerziteta v 1987. roku. Duže važna knjižka bo to Perša bola gruntovna naukova praca pro Ruševsko, angličko in mogovinovski, ki znajo. Vim tež je avtorom duže dobre knjižke Maple Leaf and Trident, the Ukrainian Canadians during the Second World War. Vse je bolo vedane Multicultural History Society of Ontario v 88. roku. Tudi, Nastupna je Mekola Kostomarov, 
a biography з нового видання Тропольського університету 96-го року. І четверта є Gathering a Heritage, Ukrainian, Slavonic and Ethnic Canada and the United States, знову ж видання Тарантонського університету 2015 року. Я прочитав три з тих книжок, я не скажу, що про їх все не, не прочитав, але я її читаю. Рекомендую вам прочитати ці дуже цікаві і добре написані книжки. Доктор Примак викладав історію в університетах Саскачевану, Торонто і Мехместер в Гамильтоні. Він член нашого наукового товариства Інна Шевченка в Торонто. Доктор Томас Примак – це дуже особливий канадський історик. Предметом його зацікавлень є, зокрема, Тема його зацікавлень є українська діаспора в Північній Америці, зокрема і інтелектуальна еліта та видатні представники цієї еліти, в першу чергу науковці, як теж наукові інституції, серед їх інтелектуальної праці. Результати його багаторічної праці він об'єднав у вже згаданій книжці під назвою «Gathering Heritage», Heritage що вийшла 2015 року. За підтримкою, як ви згадаєте, нашого наукового товариства імені Шевченка. До всього всім вам дякую. Доктор Примак є мій свого роду земляк. Бо він походить з Манітоби, я не розумію Манітоби, але я там виростав, так що, очевидно, кілька десяток років перед ним. В кожному разі я хочу вам сказати, що він народився 1948 року в Вінітезі. Його тато і мама теж були роджені в Канаді, але його дідусі і бабці емігрували до Канади і Західної України з того кута між е, Дністром і, і, і ну, Збручем, там в тих колицях. Початкові студії завершив на університетах Манітоба та Торонто. Докторат з історії, як я вже згадував, він дістав в Торонтонському університеті 1984 року. 2017 року Томас Примак одержав наукову стипендію нашого МТЕЖ на дослідження і написання статтю, статті про професора університету Манітоби Ярослава Рудницького. Це вже моя дружина згадувала, але я все-таки хочу похвалитися, що я його добре знав. Він був дуже добрий учитель, хоч я студував фізику, але всі ми з патріотизму брали українською мовою. Але то був цікаво, був дуже добрий доповідав професор і мав знаменитий сенс гумору. Він теж збирав такі цікаві англіцизми в тодішній українській мові ще давнішої імміграції. Таке, що хтось сказав, о, він біжить на майора. Тобто, не знаний інформейер, що в українській мові звучить дуже дивно. Але він таке слово збирав, почав видавати малий словничок. В кожному разі я хочу тут згадати, що причетність професора Рудницького до цієї справи багатокультурності є дуже важлива. Він був членом Кромної комісії по мовності та культурності, встановленої прем'єр-міністром Канади Лестером Пірсоном в липні 1969 року. А тим то і він був причетний до проголошення багатокультурності Канади прем'єр-міністром Пєре Елєд Трудов 71-го року, знову ж в нашій бідній Мінітезі. 
jak mówi Peretemiu, w parlamencie to prowadzę. Otóż ja zaproszę i tutaj nasza dostajna odpowiedź, a czas nam rozpowiedział dreszcze w tej sprawie. speaking about uh, Yaroslav Rudnitsky, and the exact title of my paper is The Royal Commission and Rudnitsky's Mission, The Forging of Official Multiculturalism in Canada from 1963 to 1971. So it's kind of the ancient history of multiculturalism in Canada, the very beginning. In the United States and in many other parts of the globe, Canada has the reputation of being one of the most liberal and progressive countries of the post-industrial world. Not only does it have a universal health care system, which works fairly well, so fully supported by the tax systems, both federal and provincial, the equivalent of Washington and the states in the USA, but its relatively open immigration system, its friendly acceptance of new immigrants, and their promotion in public life, even as far as the federal cabinet, which by the time of Justin Trudeau's first government contained two ministers of Muslim immigrant background, one a former Somali refugee and the other a young Afghan Canadian woman born in Iran. This is the envy of cosmopolitan and liberal minded people everywhere. In fact, the general concept of multiculturalism for which the country is famous is very significant not only because in this form it was coined and pioneered in Canada, but also because it is the well-known characteristic of the country, which is mentioned even in its fundamental law, the Canadian Constitution. The word, the word appears in a special section of that document called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And it would be very difficult to remove it, because that would probably require the agreement of the federal government, most of Canada's diverse and far-flung provinces, and a clear majority of the country's population. Consequently, Canadian official multiculturalism is unlikely to follow the example of recent events in the United States, Britain, or Australia, where multicultural policies never attained the general acceptance that they did in Canada and to the present never had the protections that they presently have in this country. But what exactly is multiculturalism? And how did it come to be accepted so widely in the North American Confederation that goes by the name of Canada? This paper will focus on the initial stages of this process and highlight the role of one Canadian citizen of the Ukrainian origin who played a prominent role. Yaroslav Bohdan Rudnitsky, pronounced, well, I've got it spelled out uh, for those who can't understand the regular Ukrainian uh, transliteration into English, I've got it spelled out a very simple way in my paper so that they can understand and pronounce it properly. Was born and raised in Eastern Europe during the last years of the existence of the Habsburg monarchy, the polity sometimes called Austria-Hungary. His home was the town of Przemysl, or Peremyshl in Ukrainian, in Austrian Galicia, which was important in Ukrainian and Polish history as the westernmost bastion of the old Ruthenian or Ukrainian identity. And it had a population before 1914 that was largely Ukrainian. After the collapse of Austria-Hungary and the end of the Polish-Ukrainian War of 1918 to 19, Przemysl, like all of the old province of Galicia, was incorporated into the new Republic of Poland. And after 1944, unlike the rest of the Ukrainian inhabitants in Galicia, fell on the Polish side of the border between the new People's Republic of Poland and the Ukrainian SSR. During this last period, it was considerably Polonized. All this reflects the fact that a rather severe Polish-Ukrainian conflict existed in the region of Rynitsky's birth throughout the entire first half of the 20th century. And this in particular, most especially that struggle for national and linguistic rights had a clear impact upon his intellectual and political formation. 
Brunitsky was educated primarily at the University of Lviv in the 1930s, when that institution was pretty much a Polish enterprise. He was a philologist or linguist by training and a specialist in Ukrainian dialects. He received his doctorate, which was a public occasion attended by the elite of Galician Ukrainian society. And I actually uh, discussed this once with the late George Lutsky, professor here at the University of Toronto. And he told me that as a, as a teenager, he was actually present at that thesis defense. And really, the, the entire elite of Galician Ukrainian society attended. It was a big public occasion. And he worked under the Polish specialist in Slavonic name, name lore, or onomastics, Witold Tashitsky, with whom he remained on good terms throughout his entire life. Tashitsky seems to have been a broad-minded scholar, and when after his graduation, Runitsky went to Berlin to work on a great Ukrainian-German dictionary, Tashitsky encouraged the young scholar in his efforts. And in Berlin, he was expected to work under the great Polish lexicographer Alexander Bruckner, who was also from Galicia, in fact, from the town of Ternopil in, eastern, in the eastern or Ukrainian part of Galicia. But Bruckner died about the same time that Brunitsky arrived, and the young Ukrainian scholar had to carry out the project without him. He did, however, work in Berlin in cooperation with Zenin Kuzelia and with the support of the Ukrainian Research Institute in Berlin. That institute, which had been financed by the Weimar Republic Foreign Ministry, had been established in the, in, by the monarchist or hetman faction of Ukrainian enemy, uh, emigres that had fled to the West after the collapse of the conservative German-supported regime of hetman Pavlo Skoropaski, and with some change of emphasis in its policies and publications, managed to survive during the Nazi dictatorship of the 1930s. But the outbreak of the Second World War interrupted Rudnitsky's project. As a Polish citizen living in Berlin, Rudnitsky was immediately arrested and spent, spent some time in a German jail. His colleagues at the Ukrainian Research Institute did not abandon him, however. And given their contacts with the German government, they intervened and managed to secure his release. Thereafter, he moved to German-occupied Prague to continue work on his dictionary. Runitsky seems to have fit in quite well in Prague, where there still precariously existed some Ukrainian scholarly institutions, most especially the Ukrainian Free University. In Prague, Runitsky married Marina Antonovich, who was the daughter of Dmitro Antonovich, a central figure in Czechoslovak Ukrainian cultural life. She was also the granddaughter of Volodymyr Antonovich, the famous founder of the Kiev School of Ukrainian Historians, sometimes called the Documentalist School, in contrast to the Romantic School, which preceded it. In 1943, Runitsky's dictionary was published to general acclaim. At that time, he also published a pocket Ukrainian-German dictionary that went through several uh, editions during the war and brought in enough income for his small family to survive. As the Reds were marched west, Rudnitsky and his family fled Prague and settled in Germany, where he taught at the University of Heidelberg and the Ukrainian Free University, which had been transferred to, to Munich from Prague. In those years, there was a general expectation among Ukrainian emigres in Western Europe that another war would soon break out between the victors of 1945, and many of them wished to make, move even further west to the Americas, primarily to the United States, but also to Canada and, to some degree, Latin America. Brunitsky himself was in touch with the Ukrainian-Canadian school teacher from Alberta, Alexander Gregorovich, father of the notable magazine editor, Andrew Gregorovich, who arranged for him to get a Canadian visa. As Canadian regulations were then in a state of flux, new immigrants from Europe were expected to find or have work in Canada immediately upon arrival. Gregorovich, who was the founding <coughs> president of the Ukrainian National Federation of Canada, the UNF, or UNO in Ukrainian, arranged for Runitsky to come to work in its museum archive library called Osiredok, or the Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Center in Winnipeg, in Western Canada. Runitsky moved to Winnipeg in 1949. 
However, Osirinik was not a well-funded institution, and Ernitsky was soon looking for work elsewhere. At that time, both in Edmonton at the University of Alberta and Winnipeg at the University of Manitoba, there were efforts by local Ukrainians, especially groups of businessmen and professional people, to establish departments of Slavic studies. Rudnitsky much preferred Winnipeg and chose to stay in Manitoba, where he funded, founded the Department of Slavic Studies and taught there until his retirement in 1977. At the time that Rudnitsky arrived in Canada, the Ukrainians already had a history of almost three quarters of a century in the country. The community had been established in three consecutive waves, each of which had social and political characteristics of its own. Very importantly, the largest and most influential in 1949 was still the first, or pioneer wave. Established between the 1890s and 1914, it was this wave which during the 20th century imprinted its character upon prairie Ukrainian culture and to which later Ukrainian ideologues of multiculturalism would time and again refer. That culture was fundamentally a peasant one, which by then was well adapted to Canadian conditions. In spite of the fact that it was the least well educated and the least nationally conscious of the three ways, and in spite of the fact that it had endured the most severe forms of Anglo-Saxon nativism and discrimination which lasted right through to 1939, and which lingered in some forms even beyond that date. Alexander Grigorovich was a representative of that pioneer wave. However, Osiretic, the institution that Rinitsky joined upon his arrival, was more associated with the second wave of Ukrainian immigrants. That wave was also predominantly peasant-based but did contain a smattering of priests, war veterans, and political activists from interwar Poland and Czechoslovakia. It was the nationalists among these who founded the UNF in Osiridek in Winnipeg. The third wave, even more nationalist, was at that time still very new and did not yet have established institutions to make its imprint upon the country. But Runitsky was flexible and kept clever enough to successfully navigate his way through all three waves, all three, three waves, and their respective institutions. And he was to contribute to all of their newspapers and publications, with the exception of those of the labor temples, which called themselves progressive and were openly pro-communist. Those pro-communists, still quite important in the 1940s, then made up about 10% of the Ukrainian Canadian population as a whole. By the 1960s, when the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism came into being, they had lost many members because of Khrushchev's denunciation of Stalin and the international events of 1956 and 1968. By then, their central organization was called the Association of United Ukrainian Canadians, and it too would prevent, present a brief to the Royal Commission. At the university, most of Rudinsky's students during the first phase of his activity were the children and grandchildren of the first and second waves. But by the 1960s and 1970s, the children of the third wave became very, very important. Rudinsky's work at the university consisted of establishing and teaching courses in Russian, Ukrainian, and Polish languages and literatures. He himself authored or edited many anthologies of materials for these courses and some of them were based upon materials gleaned from research among the then still surviving pioneers of the first wave and their children. This serious attention that Runitsky gave to the culture of the first wave stands in complete contrast to the lack of interest in early American immigrants by those post-1945 displaced person intellectuals who settled in the United States. Huge difference between Canada and the United States on this score. During the early years, Runitsky's principal collaborator and fellow member of the Slavic department was Paul Yuzik, a child of that first wave, and a historian whose career both paralleled and diverged from that of Runitsky. Both men were to leave their mark upon the early history of the multicultural movement in Canada. Meanwhile, in the early 1960s, 
national tensions in the country had been growing. These tensions had at their base a long-standing French-English conflict, which in certain ways could be traced back to the British conquest of French Canada in the 18th century. By the 1960s, increasing urbanization and secularization in Quebec had led to the growth of a new French-Canadian nationalist movement, which aimed at the establishment of an independent state in Quebec, which was a stronghold. Many French-Canadian Quebecers then feared the disappearance of their language before the spread of English, <coughs> and they expected an independent Quebec to better protect the French language and culture. In the opinion of some of them, legal parliamentary methods could not achieve this and they turned to acts of political violence to make their point. Bombs were placed in federal symbols, such as post, post office boxes. The Conservative government of John Diefenbaker, who was from Western Canada and was exceedingly unpopular in Quebec, seemed at a loss as to what to do about this, and the national crisis deepened. However, in 1963, a new Liberal Prime Minister, Lester B. Pearson, replaced Stephen Baker after a general election in which the Liberals did not quite take a majority of seats and were compelled to form a minority government, which had to rely on the support of other parties to survive. At that time, certain prominent Quebecers, in particular André Lorendo, editor of Montreal's Le Devoir, issued a call to form a Royal Commission of Bilingualism and Biculturalism. That body was to be constituted to assess the social and political situation in the country and recommend solutions to the national crisis. A few months before the new parliament was convened, in the House of Commons, Tommy Douglas, himself a Scottish immigrant and former CCF Premier of the province of Saskatchewan, whose party was to be crucial in the existence of Pearson's minority government, seconded calls from the Quebec for a royal commission and even suggested uh, possible members. His list contained both English and French Canadians, including the future Prime Minister, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, but not a single person of other cultural, national, or what would soon be more commonly called ethnic background. Douglas believed that such a commission would promote unity between, as he put it, the two great races, the two great cultures that make up this country of ours. His concern for the country and attention to the French fact was obvious. However, he was immediately criticized in the ethnic press, in particular by Winnipeg's important Ukrainsky Holos, the Ukrainian voice, which scolded him for completely ignoring the large part of the population that was neither French nor English. The paper pointed out that he should have known better, as he was from Saskatchewan, where such nationalities, as they were then sometimes called, made up about half the population, and most certainly wanted to be heard, and wanted government support not just for French and English, but for their cultures too. Pearson, who was a personal acquaintance of Laurent Do, readily, readily agreed with both him and Douglas that a high profile and serious commission was necessary. But Pearson was determined not to repeat Douglas's baneful omission. And when shortly later he and his advisors drew up a plan for the proposed Royal Commission, the document stating its purpose, first composed in French by Maurice Lamontagne, one of Pearson's ministers, put it in this way, and I quote, The Commission is instructed to recommend what stock steps should be taken to develop the Canadian Confederation on the basis of an equal partnership between the two founding races, taking into account the contribution made by other ethnic groups to the cultural enrichment of Canada and the measures that should be taken to safeguard that contribution. This was the founding document stating the mandate of the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism. When more than half a century later we look back at this document, and the very name of the commission itself, which is immediately apparent, aside from the antiquated use of the word race in the phrase two founding races, to remember to render the French les deux peuples de tour, is that bilingualism 
and biculturalism are given pride of place, and other ethnic groups only appear at the end as a sort of addendum. The first part was, of course, a direct response to the demands of French Canadian nationalists in Quebec, or at least some of the more moderate ones, who still saw some positive things about the Canadian Confederation. In particular, they were a direct response to the suggestions of André Laurendeau, who had first called for such a commission, who had first used the words bilingualism and biculturalism, at least in this context. Neither of these two bywords that should be noted here had appeared anywhere in the British North American Act, which was the founding legislative measure of the Westminster Parliament for the Dominion of Canada, and was at that time still serving as the ad hoc constitution of the Dominion. This was clearly pointed out at that time by Canada's <coughs> ethnic press, once again by Winnipeg's Ukrainsky Holos, which was suspicious of official bilingualism and strongly objected to the term biculturalism. This influential paper, for many years, had been friendly to the Liberal Party of Canada, and Pearson's edition of the second part, dealing with other Canadians and their contributions to the country, was an obvious response to such outraged Canadian opinion, especially on the prairies, where most of those other ethnic groups, especially the Slavonic groups, lived. In objecting to biculturalism, the paper cleaned claimed to speak for the approximately 27% of the country that was by that time neither English nor of French extraction, as it was then put. Indeed, when at the end of 1962 the results of the National Census of 1961 concerning ethnic groups was published, the Ukrainian-Canadian press gave them much attention. It was noted that the proportions of both French and English in the country were down considerably from the previous census, while those of others was up considerably. That the Ukrainians, at almost half a million, were now in fourth place after the British groups, the French, and the Germans. And that the Ukrainians were closely followed by the Italians, and then at a somewhat greater distance by the Poles. In 1963, the Ukrainians still outnumbered by far all of the other Slavonic groups combined. At the same time, however, the demographer Ivan Testia of Ottawa, writing in the conservative newspaper Novishlav, pointed out that the assimilation of these groups, especially linguistic assimilation, in spite of their increased numbers, was proceeding apace. And this would most certainly become a problem for them if something serious were not done in the very near future. At the time that these debates about French-English conflict and possible constitutional changes to relieve it were taking place, Rudnitsky was already the longtime chairman of the Department of Slavic Studies at the University of Manitoba. Ukrainians, who as mentioned above, then numbered almost half a million and constituted just fewer than 3% of the total Canadian population, were still primarily resident in the prairie provinces, where they made up an even greater percentage, and their predominant, uh, where they made up an even greater percentage, and Winnipeg was the predominant urban center. The heads of both major Ukrainian churches, Catholic and Orthodox, were resident there. The largest Ukrainian labor temple in the country was re was located there, and already it seems the Ukrainians were the most vocal the most insistent and the best organized of those other groups who wish to have some say in how the country should be changed to resolve the national crisis. As to Rudnitsky himself, in addition to his teaching, researching, and publishing activities, and these were considerable, he also began to make a contribution to the public debates in Canada through his academic studies as a philologist or linguist. His contributions in the Canadian sphere fall into the general category of sociolinguistics. He had first spoken on this subject at an international con conference in the early 1960s in Oslo, Norway. And on July 14, 1963, in the very midst of the pre-Royal Commission debates, spoke at the annual meeting of the Canadian Language Association in Laval, Quebec. In his speech, Rudisky maintained that Canada was really not a bilingual country at all, 
but rather a multilingual country. The bilingualism in it, he pointed out, constituted not so much the French-English kind, as rather also, rather or also, English-German, English-Atlantic, English-Ukrainian, English-Italian, and several other kinds. He rejected certain common assertions that there was a minority three-language com complex in the country, and in its place he postulated a fourfold structure. One, symbiotic enclaves in which two languages were spoken. Two, areas where a language and a dialect were spoken. Three, complex en enclaves in which only a minority language was spoken. And four, mixed areas where creolized or mixed languages were spoken. According to press reports, most members of the Canadian Linguistic Association, who studied either English or French, found this theoretical structure new and important, and suggestions were made for a future conference specifically to examine Rudinsky's thesis. Indeed, this conference seems to have had some impact beyond the ivory towers of academia, towers of academia, as shortly later, while preparing a lecture for his students in his office at the University of Manitoba, Rudinsky got a phone call from the Prime Minister of Canada, who personally invited him to join the Royal Commission then being constituted. Rudinsky immediately agreed, and when the composition of the new commission was announced, his name, together with Polish-born Paul Paczynski, a French language scholar from the University of Ottawa, made up the sole non-French and non-English contingent in that body. At this point, it should be noted that Rudinsky was one of only two members from Western Canada, was the sole linguist on the commission, and in contrast to Wyczynski, who studied French language and French literature, not Polish or Slavic, only Rudinsky studied languages other than English and French. Consequently, it is not surprising that it was Rudinsky who was to speak most assertively in defense of those other languages, and it was Rudinsky not Wyczynski, who was so clearly to make his impact upon public opinion in Canada generally. As constituted, the commission was composed of ten members, all of them distinguished Canadians, though as the Ukrainian press in Canada immediately pointed out, the membership was skewed towards Ontario and Quebec, with only those two members from the, rest, from the West, and none at all from the Maritimes east of New Brunswick, or from Newfoundland. All members were fluent in both English and French, and none with the exceptions of Rynitsky and Wyczynski seemed to have been able to speak any other languages than those two. Rynitsky was, as mentioned above, the only linguist on the panel, and he was, moreover, fluent in more than just English, French, and Ukrainian, and could also fluently speak German and Polish, and had some knowledge of other modern languages, such as Russian and Spanish, and probably several others as more as well. In, to, in addition to this, he had a classical education in Europe, and therefore a good knowledge of Latin, with which he generously sprinkled his various academic and other writings. Indeed, he was not above the occasional jab at his less well-educated readers by telling a joke or two at their expense in classical Latin. <laughs> André Laurendeau, who had first called for such a commission, and was a personal acquaintance of Lester Pearson, was the commission's chairman. And A. David Dunton, acquaintance of, uh, was co-chairman together with the French Canadian journalist Jean-Louis Garnon. Other members were equally split, split between English and French. Rudinsky seems to have had great respect for Dunton in particular. His relations with, with Laurent Doe, by contrast, were proper, though complicated by the fact that at the outset of the commission's work, the former editor of Le Devoir seems to have had very little knowledge of Western Canada and never really warmed up to that part of the country <clears throat> where so many non-charter groups lived, especially the Ukrainians, the Poles, and so many other Slavs, as government reports usually put it. In his memoirs on this commission, Laurendeau clearly stated how shocked he was to discover how different the ethnic composition of the Prairie Provinces was from central Canada, and how little hope he believed there was for the survival of French in that part of the country. But he did devote an entire footnote to Wyczynski and his contributions to French-Canadian literature, 
As to Rudnitsky, he mentioned him several times, and again, he made a special point of noting that scholar's wide knowledge of languages, which he thought unusual, especially when compared his, to his own modest knowledge of English and French. In fact, Rudnitsky's linguistic skills, especially his knowledge of German, were later to do him in good stead during his work on the commission, as the Germans were by that time by far the largest non-charter group in the country. And it would have been natural for Pearson to name at least one representative from it to serve on the Royal Commission. Indeed, the very presence of Rudnitsky on the Royal Commission seemed to have been a polite challenge to Lorando and in particular his, his until the, and in particular his until then still dominant view of Canadian bilingualism and biculturalism. <clears throat> Along with this multiculturalism, a second characteristic multilingualism rather, a second characteristic seemed to mark Rudnitsky. That was his cosmopolitanism, which came out very clearly in his habit of traveling abroad as much as possible. Prior to his appointment to the Royal Commission, Rudnitsky had already traveled widely across Canada and the United States. He had already lived in Poland and Germany, had studied in France, and traveled elsewhere in Europe. In 1955, in fact, he had even authored a booklet titled Spodorozhi na vkolo pivskvitu, Travels Across Half the World. Indeed, it was his habit to visit various countries and cities, observe the cultures, and try to relate them to his work as a professional Slavist and a Ukrainian scholar. Thus, he assiduously described the various libraries, museums, archives, and art galleries that held Ukrainian or Slavonic materials. And when he returned home, he published on them still another little booklet or two, inevitably modest size, but always significant. Consequently, just as soon as he was named to the commission and the preliminaries were completed, he was off to Belgium, Switzerland, and North Italy to study linguist the linguistic situations in those countries and report his findings back to the Royal Commission. These were mostly about the rights of linguistic minorities in each country or region. In fact, it may even have been Rudnitsky above all who became the butt of Pearson's complaint made many years later in his memoir that one reason why the Royal Commission was so slow in completing its work and was so expensive was that some members of the Commission used their Commission funds to carry out their scholarly dreams and do their academic work that they would have done anyway had they been able to pay, obtain funding from elsewhere. However, scholarly work was only one aspect of the Commission's task. Equally important, was its attempt to hear the varied opinions of as many sectors of Canadian society as possible. It completed this task through public hearings and written briefs submitted to it by various people, institutions, and groups. To guide them in their task of preparing briefs, the Commission issued a working paper in which it outlined the government's concerns with promoting bilingualism and biculturalism, and also stated that there were, while there were many languages in Canada that, were, Canada that were unofficial, they too must be respected and safeguarded, and that multiculturalism was a simple fact in Canadian reality that, as the working paper frankly put it, must not be suppressed as quickly as possible. A few months later, Runitsky's Manitoba colleague, Paul Yuzik, who had just been appointed to the Senate of Canada by the outgoing Prime Minister, John Diefenmaker, in his maiden speech to that body, quoted from that working paper, and again used the word multiculturalism, and made it the theme of the speech. Yuzik stressed that the role of what he called the third element in Canada's history and culture referenced the Canadian Bill of Rights passed by the previous Conservative government. In fact, the implication of this speech seemed to be an expansion of those Canadian rights into the cultural realm through the recognition of Canada as a multicultural nation. This, too, was an important first step in the great lobbying effort of non-charter group Canadians to dismiss all talk of Laurendeau's biculturalism and get multiculturalism recognized as a fact to be promoted and included in the laws and national self-image of the country. 
Over the following months and years, music was to return to this theme many times. For example, a month after his Senate speech, in which he said a few words in Ukrainian, he spoke to a group of Ukrainian professionals in Ottawa and repeated the points that he had just made in Parliament. He told those Toronto Ukrainians that a certain female French-Canadian senator had then congratulated him in French and asked him in what language he was speaking. Not speaking much French, the Canadian press later reported, he quietly replied, oh, one of our other Canadian languages, Ukrainian. Such an incident in the Senate chamber of the Parliament of Canada was most certainly indicative of the attitude of the bulk of the leadership of the Ukrainian community in Canada towards those new concepts of bilingualism and biculturalism, which the government, in their eyes, under pressure from French Canada, seemed to be forcing upon the country. Over the next several years, the Royal Commission received briefs and recommendations from writers, scholars, universities, professional associations, ethnic and cultural groups, business associations, churches, and other institutions. With regard to other Canadians, Poles, Germans, and Jews all presented briefs. But when the process had ended, there was no doubt in anyone's mind that the Ukrainians were more interested than anyone else as their numerous organizations had presented by far the largest number of briefs, and many of these had been closely argued, strongly worded, and vigorously presented. <clears throat> One of the best examples of this Ukrainian concern was a meeting in Winnipeg in which the umbrella organization of most of the Ukrainians in the country, the Ukrainian Canadian Committee, or UCC, was headquartered. When it came to present their briefs, the Ukrainians insisted on speaking in Ukrainian, which shocked the commissioners and set them completely off track. In spite of the ready availability of translators and Rudnitsky on the commission, the panel told the Ukrainians in no uncertain way to present their briefs in either English or French, but the Ukrainians insisted on doing it in Ukrainian. Much attention ensued. Voices were raised in protest. Thereupon, the commissioners suddenly threatened to cut the hearing short and leave Winnipeg without hearing the briefs. Eventually, the Ukrainians were forced to relent, and their briefs were presented in either English or French. But as one of the secretaries of the commission, who was an eyewitness to these proceedings, later remarked, this, this left a bad taste in the mouths of most of the commissioners, who later on never quite seemed to get over it. This stormy meeting in Winnipeg was symptomatic of the situation that the Royal Commission was in. It had a mandate regarding bilingualism and biculturalism, but this framework for solving the country's political problems <clears throat> was repeatedly challenged by ethnic groups led by the Ukrainians. These Ukrainians absolutely rejected both the imposition of English-French bilingualism on their communities and the entire idea of English-French biculturalism. In general, if they could not get official language status for themselves, they wished English to be the only official language of the country. At heart, of course, was a rejection of the idea that all non-charty language groups should eventually give up their languages and cultures and assimilate into the, either the English or the French group. This phenomenon, as mentioned above, was already happening to many of these groups, and the leaderships of some of these groups like the Ukrainians in particular, were seriously concerned about this. Very importantly, the Ukrainians argued that on the prairies at least, they were in many places the original pioneers who had first broken the sod and cut back the bush, and in fact were proud founders of the western provinces. This was a clear response to the government's two founding races concept. Consequently, it was argued, they too had a clear right to survive and develop. This seemed to go considerably beyond the mandate of the Commission, which had been struck for no other reason but to address the burning French-English conflict of those days. But with the passing of time, it became clear to all that while official bilingualism was a primary concern of most of the Commission, 
the bicultural part of the mandate was misstated and perhaps in direct conflict with the addendum on other groups that Pearson and his advisors had seemingly added at the last moment. Moreover, though prior to the Commission's work there had been much talk of two nations in Canada and a third force made up of other groups, during the course of the hearings these concepts too quietly dropped out of currency, at least outside of Quebec. Among the Ukrainians, for example, the two nations idea was only supported by the pro-communist Association of United Ukrainian Canadians, which had a labor temple origin. In general, it was rejected by a large majority throughout English-speaking Canada, and this included the bulk of the non-charter groups as well. Moreover, the third force concept, which had been proposed in Parliament by Yuzik in his multiculturalism speech, was very soon discovered to be erroneous by the Commissioner who quickly noted that, in their opinion at least, those very others had very little in common, either with regard to national policies or even interest in the Commission's work. As to Runitsky, he was always primarily concerned with the language question and tried to give it a non-political, scholarly tone. For him, language was the key to culture, and the extension of French language rights in the country was to be accompanied by the extension of minority language rights as well. Thus, it is quite probable that on the one hand, he himself played some backroom part in that emotional confrontation over language in Winnipeg. Certainly, some of the Ukrainian briefs to the Commission later on in Toronto, which was not his hometown, as was Winnipeg, were coordinated, were coordinated with him. And at least one presenter of such, as, at least one presenter of such a brief later testified to me. But on the other hand, there is also some evidence that the major brief submitted by the UCC, that's the Ukrainian Canadian Committee as it was called at that time, was largely prepared in coordination with Senator Paul Yuzik in Ottawa, not Runitsky in Winnipeg. And by this time, Yuzik and Runitsky were not on good terms, despite the partial concurrence of their political goals. Indeed, one well-informed contemporary who knew both men well described their relationship as one of, quote, mistrust and even enmity, unquote. With regard to Yuzik, who has sometimes been called the father of Canadian multiculturalism, it is true that he was the first person in Parliament to use the term, and he popularized it thereafter in his speeches throughout the country. With time, it was a concept that became more and more accepted, although at that early stage, no one quite knew what it meant, other than perhaps more respect for various ethnic groups and languages. But Yuzik's present persistence eventually was to pay off in a very big way. While Yuzik was also concerned with the Ukrainian language in Canada, and even defended its use in Parliament, where he informally claimed that it is another Canadian language, it was culture not language that became for him the main thrust. By contrast, for Rudnitsky, it was firstly language, and then later everything else. Also, Rudnitsky's character, with his cosmopolitanism, his multilingualism, his wide travels, and many interests outside of pure politics, stood in complete contrast with Yuzik, who ploddingly but stubbornly hammered away at the same thing again and that theme was the concept of multiculturalism, which he linked to the disappearance of ethnic and national discrimination, of which he seemed to have had some kind of experience with earlier in his life. Perhaps Isaiah Berlin's famous quip about Leo Tolstoy's view of history being represented by the hedgehog and the fox was equally applicable in the case of the Ukrainian Canadians, Rudnitsky and Yuzik. Berlin cited this ancient Greek proverb to the, fact, to the effect that the fox knows many things, whereas the hedgehog knows only one thing, but knows it very well indeed. Not hedgehogs, but rather porcupines are native to Canada. And so in Rudinsky can be clearly seen Berlin's fox who knows many things, and in Yuzik, the porcupine, who knows only one thing, but knows it very, very well. 
the BNB Commission's report and the government's response to it would determine which would be the more successful strategy in mid-20th century Canada. The final years of the commission works, Commission's work were epochal for Canada and its minorities. Those were the years of the Great Flag Debate, which decided that the old Red Ensign had to be replaced with a national flag that was more representative of the independence from Britain that had been achieved in the previous decades. Indeed, the design of a red maple leaf on a white field with two bar red bars on each end was chosen. Those were the years of the World's Fair, Expo 67, which was held in Montreal, and the Pan American Games, which were held in Winnipeg. And the entire country celebrated the centenary of the Dominion. Those were also the years of Charles de Gaulle's Vive le Québec Libre speech from the balcony of Montreal's City Hall, of intensified FLQ violence in Quebec, the October Crisis, and the murders of Quebec Minister Pierre Laporte and the British envoy, James Cross, and the controversial War Measures Act, which clamped down on that terrorist group. And finally, those were the years when the Trudeau government <coughs> launched its reorientation of Canadian foreign policy and its openings to Cuba, Red China, and the USSR. All of these factors played some role in the psychological and political framework within which the Commission did its work. At the end of the 1960s, the first books of the BNB report were published to much acclaim, and the government moved very quickly to implement its first recommendations. These primarily concerned measures to promote French English bilingualism at all levels of the federal government, in crown corporations such as the CDC, an increased presence of French in particular in schools, universities, and in business. The Commission recommended that French rights, rights and bilingualism be extended as well in both New Brunswick, which was 35% Francophone, Canadian invented word Francophone, and Ontario, which was only 7% Francophone. One of its key recommendations was the provision of French and English linguistic rights, not only in areas where each was a majority, but also in areas where each formed a minority of at least 10% of the population. The government moved very fast in its effort to discover and define such districts across the country. As to other languages in Canada, which was Renitsky's special interest, they were also to be promoted in certain ways, such as access to radio and television, their use as subjects but not languages of instruction in the schools and universities, and their acceptance as qualifying second languages to enter those universities. All of the members of the Commission, including Rudnitsky and Vichinsky, agreed with this. However, Rudnitsky did not stop there. Given his political background in Galicia and Poland, and his special interest in languages, and undeterred by the skepticism of his commissioner colleagues, including Polish-born Paul Vichinsky, the professor from Manitoba cast a votum separatum, or dissenting opinion, printed in Book One of the Commission's report, which recommended that not only should English and French minorities receive special light rights where they made up 10% or more of the population, but that such rights should also be extended to all other groups, specifically what were then the largest non-official languages of Canada, German, Ukrainian, and Italian. In other words, Runitsky, the European-oriented linguist and the European-educated linguist, whose job in Canada was to teach such languages, applied to Canada the regional principle, or the old East European model of national territorial autonomy, which at any rate had already been proposed for English and French by his commissioner colleagues. When Book One was still in the course of being published, Runitsky had clearly explained to the press that though his fellow commissioners believed that the minority rights were already well protected in its recommendations, he simply did not agree, and that the report failed to address its terms of reference to suggest steps to be taken to safeguard 
as we read, quote, the contributions of those other groups. He specifically mentioned the Ukrainians on the prairies, who lived in a compact block in a line running along the northern rim of, the, rim of those prairies from Manitoba through Saskatchewan to Alberta, and also the Germans in some other parts of the prairies, and perhaps the Italians in Toronto and Montreal, as well as an Indian Eskimo in the Northwest Territories and in the Yukon. Elsewhere, Rudinsky even argued that each group within a state has, quote, an inborn right to develop and preserve, unquote, its language, and that such a right should be naturally given constitutional protection. And even wrote a personal letter to Prime Minister Pearson shortly before the end of his mandate, bringing his attention to the votum separatum. Pearson immediately penned a polite response, saying that he had indeed given careful attention to Rudnitsky's statement, but that this matter was the responsibility not only of Ottawa, but also particularly, that's Pearson's word, particularly of the provinces, which had jurisdiction in matters of education. In general, however, the government reacted very slow to these last recommendations of the Commission. Indeed, it even seemed to be ignoring Book 4, which dealt with other groups, and did, did this even though Big Book 4, on which Paul Mashinsky seemed to have worked very assiduously, was one of the weightiest and most substantial of all six books. It was in the hands of the government by October 1969, but no action was taken on the matter throughout all of 1970. By the spring of 1971, however, the ethnic press in Canada, in particular Winnipeg's Ukrainsky Rolls, was beginning to voice some fairly sharp complaints about it. Meanwhile, the new Prime Minister, Pierre Trudeau, and the Ukrainians became locked in a vociferous dispute over Canadian foreign policy. For some time, Trudeau had made it clear that he wanted to exercise a foreign policy more independent of the United States of America, and more friendly to the communist rule states. His move towards closer relations with Cuba, Red China, and the USSR were received by, with consternation by the Ukrainians, whose leadership, with the exception of the labor temples, was solidly anti-communist. When in the spring of 1971, Trudeau undertook a state visit to the USSR, it was followed with close interest by all, and very soon set the alarm bells ringing. In May 1971, Trudeau and his new wife, Margaret, boarded a plane for Moscow. During his 11-day visit, they traveled from Moscow to Kiev, Tashkent, the Soviet North, and Leningrad. Mitchell Sharp took over the role of acting prime minister in Trudeau's absence. Trudeau arrived in Moscow on May 17, where he was met by a military guard of honor and a small group of about 100 Soviet citizens seemingly mostly top officials. Posters on the streets read, Long live the ship friendship between the peoples of Canada and the Soviet Union. The new Canadian flag decorated some of Moscow's main streets, and articles on Canada appeared in Izvestia and in Pravda. These articles claimed that there were no outstanding problems between the USSR and Canada, but rather much room for cooperation. Trudeau met with Brezhnev and considered his visit historic, as indeed it was, though probably not in the way that he envisioned it. Trudeau told Brezhnev that the Western powers should do their part in reducing military confrontation in Central Europe. And he publicly stated that he hoped for economic and other kinds of cooperation between Canada and the Soviet Union, and that Canada could learn much from the Soviet experiences in the North. After three days of long talks with Soviet leaders, Brezhnev, Kosygin, and Podgorny, marked by warm greetings, Trudeau flew to Kiev, where he arrived on May 21st. 
He was accompanied by his wife and a small corps of Canadian officials and journalists. In Kiev, Trudeau's party was greeted even more warmly than in Moscow. The crowd seemed to be larger, and the Soviet Ukrainian representatives more friendly. At a large official banquet, Trudeau told the Ukrainians that many of their countrymen lived in Canada, and those separated by thousands of miles from Ukraine, quote, live in a political structure which is, in essence, the same as the Soviet <laughs> Union. <laughs> Trudeau was, of course, referring to the supposed federal structure of the Soviet state, and not the dictatorship of the Communist Party. Trudeau further stated that large countries like Canada and the USSR needed a federal system to balance state and local interests. Questions of family reunification were also addressed, but elsewhere. At the same time, however, Trudeau did not raise several questions which the Ukrainians back home would have liked him to raise with the Soviets. These included the question of Ukrainian dissidents, prisoners of conscience, held in Soviet prisons. The word gulag was only to enter the English language a few years later when Alexander Solzhenitsyn published his magnum opus on that infamous archipelago. At the time, the most celebrated of these dissidents was the nationalist Valentin Moroz who was by that time a darling of the Ukrainian nationalist press in the West. As well, Trudeau predicted, as predicted by Ukrainsky Holos, did not raise the question of the Ukrainian consulate in Kiev to help with family reunions. That too was an issue widely discussed in the Ukrainian Canadian press. The public logic in that case was that such a consulate would be of great importance to family reunifications. The unstated reason, of course, was to further international recognition of the existence of a Ukrainian polity which pointed to the existence of a distinct Ukrainian nation. But the general atmosphere of Trudeau's visit to Kiev, in which traditional Ukrainian hospitality was extremely evident, was very positive, and was clearly reflected in an important article published in the newspapers of the Southern Chain by the syndicated journalist Charles Lynch who was one of the journalists accompanying the Prime Minister. Lynch seemed to have been completely swept away by the lavish Ukrainian hospitality. We behaved like a bunch of Canadian Irishmen turned loose in Dublin for the first time. <laughs> we sang, we danced, like all good Ukrainians and Irishmen, we cried a little. Lynch was very impressed with the Ukrainians he met, who all seemed to know quite a bit about Canada even those who didn't have any relatives in the country. As one citizen of Kiev put it to me, he wrote, he understands that Canada consists of the English in the West, the French in the East, and the Ukrainians in between. <laughs> this unlikely opinion turned out to be quite true, however, when it came to Greece presented to the Royal Commission. Of Trudeau's speech to the Ukrainians, Lynch picked out the following passage in which the PM said that he would seize the opportunity to learn as much as I can of the way your local governments deal with the kind of problems that the provinces face in Canada. The Canadian journalist then remarked that never before had any prime minister been so sympathetic or uncritical of the Soviet Union. Throughout it all, said Lynch, Trudeau seemed relaxed and at ease, as did his hosts and the journalists, too. Just call me Lynchenko, concluded, <laughs> concluded the Irish-Canadian reporter. From Kiev, Trudeau went on to Tashkent and the Soviet North, where he again praised Soviet development. But no one in his party, not even the Prime Minister himself, it seems, was no more impressed anywhere than by his reception in Ukraine. Upon his return to Canada, as among his opponents, at least, his, uh, his opponents at least, the Prime Minister was immediately faced with the reaction of astonishment and outrage. This was true not only in Parliament, but also in the press, both national and ethnic. And some of this criticism seemed to spill over into internal Canadian and even constitutional questions. Indeed, even before the Prime Minister had returned, 
the Ukrainian Canadian Committee has sent a sharp protest to Mitchell Sharp about Trudeau's comparisons between Canada and the Soviet Union. And in the press, particularly Toronto's Globe and Mail, excoriated the Prime Minister for saying that Canada should follow the example of the Soviets in the, develop in the development of the North, pointing out that the Siberian city that has so impressed Trudeau, Norilsk, had been built with slave labor from the extensive Soviet prison camp system. Then on May 28th, the very first day back in Parliament, Diefenbaker attacked Trudeau for saying that the U.S. economic and military influence in Canada were negative, and the Tory House leader, J.B. Baldwin, criticized him for his superficial and misleading comparisons of Soviet and Canadian federalism. Meanwhile, in Parliament and the national press, Trudeau was criticized for ignoring the plight of the Ukrainian political prisoners in the USSR. Even as far away as the United States, Trudeau's position on Ukrainian dissidents and freer Ukrainian immigration from the Soviet Union was brought up on the pages of the US and World Report, which noted that the PM should have said something about this during his visit, and that by ignoring the question, he offended about 300,000 Ukrainians living in Canada. In Parliament, Trudeau replied to these criticisms by saying that anyone who breaks the law for the sake of nationalism would not get any sympathy from him. And that he had brought up the matter, and that had he brought up the matter of imprisoned Ukrainians in the Soviet Union, his hosts would have said, you imprison FLQ nationalists, why can't we imprison Ukrainian nationalists? At which Canadian papers like the Winnipeg Free Press commented, that the FLQ kidnapped, murdered, and was alleged to have planned to seize power in Quebec by violence. Whereas Ukrainian dissidents and Soviet prisoners in Soviet prisons, like the writer Vyacheslav Chernobyl, the almost blind scientist Bogdan Horin, and the peaceful dissident Sviatoslav Karavansky, were all imprisoned merely for their views. Which in fact were no different from those of the Quebec separatist leader René Lévesque and Trudeau's own liberal colleague, Gérard Pelletier. The paper concluded that in Canada, the B&B Commission had been called to deal with such matters. Indeed, throughout the spring and summer of 1971, the reaction of the organized Ukrainian community was furious and insistent, especially in eastern Canada, where the most politically active and nationalistic of the Ukrainians, third waivers, then lived. Those Ukrainians insisted that Trudeau apologize for his pro-Soviet remarks, while others, especially in Western Canada, where most of the children and grandchildren of the earlier immigrants then lived, pressed even harder for multiculturalism. Meetings between the Prime Minister and the Ukrainians, and between Gérard Peltier and the Ukrainians took place, for as one participant in them later recalled, the Ukrainians required placating and a policy of multiculturalism and the home front became more important than ever. Little did either the Canadian papers, or even the Ukrainian Canadians, or the Prime Minister and his fighters know that while he was visiting Ukraine, a sharp power struggle was transpiring between two Ukrainian Communist Party factions. One led by Petro Shellist, which represented a kind of local patriotism, and wish to expand the powers of the Ukrainian SSR in language and in national matters. And another led by Volodymyr Shcherbitsky, which was much more subservient to the centralizing and Russifying directives of Moscow. Had the Prime Minister been more attuned to such matters, he would have noticed, as did the Ukrainian press in Canada, that when his translator, the Liberal MP from Ontario named Walter Deacon, spoke in Ukrainian to those Soviet Ukrainian officials in Kiev, the capital of Soviet Ukraine, they always answered those questions, not in Ukrainian, the ostensible language of their Union Republic, but rather only in the Russian of the Moscow center. This was then the general rule when dealing with foreigners throughout the USSR, it was more or less the equivalent of replying in French, of replying to French-speaking President de Gaulle 
only in English while he was visiting Quebec City and was hardly conducive to favoring local interests over central ones, as Trudeau seemed to imagine. These kinds of debates over national questions in Canada and the USSR continued throughout the summer of 1971, and especially engaged the Ukrainian Canadian press. By summer, by midsummer, a date was finally announced for the reciprocal visit to Canada of the USSR Premier Alexei Kosygin. It was to occur on October 1971. By fall, however, Trudeau clearly had planned his next moves in his general campaign for political and constitutional changes in Canada. On October 8th, he at long last rose in the House of Commons to address the fourth book of the B&B Commission, the one dealing with other ethnic groups. In his speech to Parliament, Trudeau said that the government accepted all those recommendations of the Royal Commission contained in Book 4. He continued, it was the view of the Royal Commission, shared by the government, and I am sure by all Canadians, that there cannot be one cultural policy for Canadians of British and French origin, another for the original peoples, and yet a third for all others. For although there are two official languages, there is no official culture, nor does any ethnic group take precedence over any other a policy of multiculturalism within a bilingual framework commends itself to the government as the most suitable means of assuring the cultural freedom of Canadians. Such a policy should help break down discriminatory attitudes and cultural jealousies. A vigorous policy of multiculturalism will help create confidence. Trudeau then went into the details of how the government intended to do this the first of which was to provide help to all cultural groups with a desire to grow and develop. It would do this through special programs in various government departments, agencies, and crown corporations, including the National Film Board, the National Museum of Man, as well as the citizenship branch of the Secretary of State. All these policies and measures were greeted warmly for various parties in, in the House of Commons. The very next day, the Prime Minister flew 1,300 miles from Ottawa to Winnipeg to address the 10th Triennial Congress of the Ukrainian Canadian Committee, among whom there were many opponents of the Liberals and supporters of the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada, and the former Prime Minister, John Ethan Baker in particular. Trudeau most certainly knew that he was walking into the strongest anti-communist ethnic lobby in the country. Moreover, shortly before the Prime Minister spoke, Yuri Derevich, <laughs> a delegate from Toronto, spoke and openly demanded that the government recognize not only individual rights of Canadians, as was done usually in the Anglo-Saxon tradition, but also some groups which lay outside that tradition. The government was informed beforehand that Derevich would be speaking on this topic, and it requested the Ukrainian text of the speech so, it, so that it could make a translation available to the Prime Minister in advance of his own address to the Congress, and perhaps note the concerns of Ukrainian Canadians, such as Derevich. In his address to the Ukrainians, which was about the same length as his speech to, in Parliament, Trudeau did approach this question, and he praised the Ukrainian prairie pioneers for their hardiness in surviving the difficult initial years of the frozen prairie and taming the wilderness for Canadian civilization. He stated, he said, stated that things had changed since then, and today no single race or linguistic component of the country had an absolute majority. Every single person in Canada is now a member of a minority group, he said. Canada, therefore, is a multicultural society. Third language would not have an official character, but would, however, be accorded government support. And all recommendations of the BNV Commission were accepted, especially in culture. 
He then mentioned by name the Ukrainian artists like William Karelik, Leo Moll, and the composer George Fiala, and ended by saluting the contributions to Canada made by all persons of all ethnic origins. This speech was met by pure relation by those usually vociferously anti-communist Ukrainian representatives present. Many rushed forward to greet the Prime Minister and shake his hand, and pictures were published in the press of Trudeau surrounded by friendly Ukrainian Canadians, including the Reverend Vasil Kushnir, President of the UCC, which at this meeting officially changed its name to Ukrainian Canadian Congress. Paul Yuzik in particular could be very satisfied that bilingualism, or rather biculturalism, had been dropped, and the newer conception of multiculturalism, for which he worked so hard, accepted. For several years, this had also been the position of most Ukrainian organizations and newspapers in the country. At the same time, it should be noted that Trudeau has said absolutely nothing about multilingualism and did not even address Runitsky's votum separatum in Book 1 of the BNB report, though no one seemed to notice this on that exciting day for Canadian ethnics. But it could hardly have passed by Runitsky himself, the professional linguist who had pressed so hard for it. During the following weeks, there continued to be intense discussions of multiculturalism and other themes raised by Trudeau in his speech. At the same time, there was also the suggestion that the Prime Minister had come to Winnipeg specifically to quiet the critics of his foreign policy among the Ukrainians, and to ensure that Kosygin's upcoming visit to Canada would carry on without a hitch. <laughs> I guess you know something about that already. We heard about this in Parliament by the Conservative member Steve Poprotsky, <clears throat> Trudeau said that he would consult Ukrainian Canadians about what to say to Kosygin. Many years later, the idea was still current that Trudeau's entire speech on multiculturalism, and especially his visit to Winnipeg, was a ploy to satisfy the Ukrainians on the very eve of Kosygin's visit. Certainly, the timing could not have been more suggestive. It was only a week or so later that Alexei Kosygin got off his plane from Moscow and stepped onto Canadian soil. In spite of the government's proper welcome and the occasional mention in the press that he was the most open and ostensibly liberal of the Kremlin men, he was met everywhere by demonstrators and protesters, mostly East European in origin, who objected to Soviet rule in their countries or Soviet influences generally. Of these, Ukrainians who wanted to see the end of Soviet rule in Ukraine, and Jews who wanted freedom to emigrate for Soviet Jews were probably the most prominent. Kosygin was even attacked and almost dragged to the ground in Ottawa by one angry Hungarian protester who objected to the Soviet suppression of the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. In Toronto, the demonstration seemed to be getting out of hand when the Toronto City Police on horses charged into the crowds and some people were hurt and had to be taken to hospital. Although Canada and the USSR did sign some economic and technology agreements during the course of this official visit, it can hardly have been seen as a complete success from either Trudeau's or the Soviet view. The publicity surrounding the visit was very bad indeed for the Soviets, and it raised numerous questions about the legitimacy of Soviet rule in Eastern Europe. If, in fact, Trudeau's speeches in Parliament and in Winnipeg were partly a ploy to buy off those Canadian ethnics, many of whom were of East European background. It most certainly did not work. As for Rudnitsky and the BNB Commission, their recommendations and formal acceptance by the government began a sea change in Canadian affairs. And I'm coming to the end now. In 1982, multiculturalism, spelled thus without any hyphen, was written into the Canadian Constitution, and in 1988 confirmed by statute. But what exactly was meant by this new term, which in the following years was to catch on in so many countries throughout the Western world? Shortly after Trudeau's speech in Winnipeg, the Canadian Ethnic Press Foundation asked Rubinsky this very question. It wanted an authoritative response 
that could be published in all the non-English and non-French newspapers of Canada. Rudinsky then composed a careful statement that pointed out that Trudeau's new policy was long overdue, but should be welcomed, even though it did not go as far as he would have liked. He summarized the policy somewhat obliquely as majoritarian dualism and minoritarian pluralism on the one hand, and a confession of Canadianism on the other. In general, he was still optimistic, but he clearly did not like the term bilingualism, which he pointed out was the invention of Lorando. And he warned that minority linguistic rights, rights had not yet been guaranteed, and they would have to be addressed in any new Czech constitutional changes to come. <clears throat> what Ranitsky meant by that statement about a confession of faith in Canadianism is not quite clear. But it has to be admitted that certain contradictions and misunderstandings plagued the Royal Commission from its very founding. And Ranitsky caught on to this fairly early. Reflecting upon the matter many years later, Lester Pearson, ever the moderate, ever the negotiator, put his thoughts on the Commission and his work in the following careful manner. As soon as we were in government, we began the work of setting up the Bilingualism and Biculturalism Commission. This was to be the grand inquest into relations between Canada's two major language groups. There was not too much difficulty over the terms of reference, though we did make one mistake of which we soon learned. We failed to take adequately into account the sensitivities of citizens of other cultural backgrounds and the problems of multiculturalism. Indeed, a problem of almost multilingualism. We mentioned this, but we gave the impression that there were really only two elements in Canada's development, the English fact, if you like, and the French fact. The wording of the terms of reference aroused the suspicion that we were, in effect, dismissing other ethnic groups, although we did appoint a Ukraine-Canadian to the Commission. Pearson then zeroed in on the basic assumption of its time, one that was at the heart of the non-charter group objections to how the commission had been set up. And this is Pearson. What we had in mind, of course, was that while these other groups, leaving aside Canadian indigenous inhabitants for the moment, have made their own contributions, the Canadian Foundation was essentially dual. Those who by choice came to Canada later were expected to fit into one or the other of the two founding groups for language purposes. These important words of Pearson were probably written after Trudeau's compromise solution was proposed and reflect not only the situation in 1963, but also everything that had happened since, especially that important 1971 promulgation of multiculturalism as government policy. In the following years, ever more clarity was given to the concept of multiculturalism. In 1988, the same year that the new conservative Mulroney government confirmed multiculturalism by statute and tried to shift this emphasis from government grants for cultural groups to the hiring of people of diverse background in government and business, Jean Burnett, who had been a secretary of the BNB Commission and had been present at that stormy meeting with the Winnipeg Ukrainians in 1963, defined it thus for the Canadian Encyclopedia. One, it refers to a society characterized by ethnic and cultural diversity. Two, it refers to the ideals of equality and mutual respect among these groups. And three, it refers to government policies to promote these ideals. Insofar as Canadian society has moved in this direction, multiculturalism has made some progress in Canada. Canadian diversity is seldom ch challenged today, as is the ideal of mutual respect and equality. French is no longer in danger in the province of Quebec. Native peoples, now often called First Nations, are more respected than in the past. And, as recommended by Ranitsky, are even enjoying linguistic rights, guaranteed linguistic rights, in the North. Moreover, very importantly, newcomers are still being welcomed. But at the same time, it has to be admitted 
that the refusal of various Canadian governments, both federal and provincial, to grant full and unfettered legal and constitutional status to various other languages, particularly on a regional basis, as Rudnitsky specifically demanded in his famous votum separatum, has had a decisive and negative effect upon those languages. And by 1988, the Royal Commissioner from Manitoba saw it very clearly indeed. The general decline of German, Ukrainian, and Italian languages among the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of immigrants from earlier years, foreseen and feared by some Ukrainian and other observers in the 1960s, when they were still widely spoken, has not been stopped, even in the slightest, and those so-called immigrant languages a term the unstated implications of which were rejected by both Rudnitsky and Music, in contravention to the formal terms of reference set out by Pearson in 1963, to this day do not sh share sufficient legal guarantees for their preservation. Consequently, while the BNB Commission succeeded in many ways in changing Canadian federal, Canadian and provincial policy, Canadian constitutional law, and even, I would venture to say, the Canadian character itself, Rudnitsky, Rudnitsky's ideal remains in part unachieved. Indeed, during the course of the entire multilingualism debate of the 1960s and early 1970s, Rudnitsky developed a new sociolinguistic concept, which he called linguicide, by which he meant the restriction of the national de natural development of any language or dialect especially by any government action or inaction. All of these languages, he claimed, had an inborn right to exist and to evolve and develop. <coughs> Nevertheless, his mission was clearly stated at that time and is a historical fact, an ideal that was acted upon and defended, and in the early 1960s reflected something important and good about this country. A multicultural confederation was indeed a courageous proposition in the 1963 Dominion of Canada. And though Ukrainian and other such languages are much less widely spoken today, they have been replaced by other, newer languages, spoken by immigrants from many other countries, especially from Asia and the so-called Third World, who are presently coming to Canada in large numbers and are making another unique contribution to Canadian life letters, and culture. So while multiculturalism remains strong in Canada, so too in many ways, not quite expected by Ronitsky and his colleagues, does multilingualism. establishment of multiculturalism. Uh, he was one person on the on the committee. He wasn't working in a vacuum. The Ukrainian community certainly was very vocal. You know, society, societal attitudes to cultural pluralism have changed. So, uh, you know, so would the general thrust of society uh, and the representations have carried the day? And if Rudnitsky had not been on the commission, uh, how do you think he would have uh, fared as, a, as a, a private citizen or as a representative of the Ukrainian community? Would he have been as, uh, you know, presented the same ideas and been as active? That, I think, is a, well, both are very difficult questions to answer. Um, as I was writing this paper, um, it occurred to me that there was a kind of rivalry between Rudnitsky and Music. A rivalry with, that went right back to Winnipeg when they taught together at the University of Manitoba. And uh, 
may have had something to do with their different backgrounds. Rudnitsky, of course, was a post-1945 immigrant, well-educated, brought up in the privileged surroundings, really. He was part of the elite of Khaleesi Ukrainian society, or would soon become so, and he stayed there. Was a self-confident man, uh, was outgoing, was uh, so confident, in fact, that he could even joke about himself and others and get away with it without offending anybody. Um, and was uh, clear and insistent on his views, in defending uh, what he thought was right about uh, promoting Ukrainian rights in Canada. By contrast, Paul Yuzik was a representative of the oldest pioneer immigration in Canada, which, as I have indicated, was primarily a peasant immigration, by and large not well-educated, by and large not highly nationalistic. Some of them had practically no national consciousness whatsoever, but they had an ethnic consciousness, but not a national consciousness. And very importantly, was very uh, severely discriminated against during those early years in Canada, especially before the First World War, but really extending right up until the Second World War, right up until 1939. So this difference uh, molded the characters of the two men. And Runiski, with his outgoing character and his pride and uh, assertiveness, um, grated on the nerves of, of, of uh, music. So they didn't get along well, either at Manitoba or then later on when they were in, entered political life. But both of them contributed to this new idea of multiculturalism. As it turned out, the major idea was, uh, of, of Brunitsky, multilingualism, was never really accepted in Canada. Whereas the idea of music, multiculturalism, was accepted. So we can say that in some ways, music was succeeded where, where Brunitsky failed. As to um, uh, multiculturalism itself, it's really hard to say who contributed more. And uh, who was, who, for example, uh, who was behind uh, uh, organizing all these briefs to the commission? And there were many, many Ukrainian briefs. And who was pushing it? And did the, the fact that Runitsky sat on the commission give the Ukrainians the confidence to submit so many briefs and to demand so much? And who stood by them? Which other groups stood? None of them. Nobody stood by the Ukrainians. Everybody was relatively quiet. The Poles were relatively quiet. The Italians said practically nothing at all. The Ukrainians did it. The Ukrainians are responsible for the multiculturalism in Canada today. <coughs> and in fact, it's in the Canadian Constitution. So uh, many people were involved. Uh, who uh, advised who? And, in the presenting of briefs, um, I'm not sure about, you know, probably in some cases Rinitsky and other places use it. But there are people in this room who presented briefs to the commission. So <laughs> I, would, I would ask their opinion on this matter and if they, they got any input or <coughs> eager as to prominent men. Uh, yes, we can go to the next question. I well, just to add to this uh, conversation, uh, there were some people right in the room here who, who made a big contribution. I would say even bigger than the two. I think the key one was Rudnitsky. Absolutely no question. He's, he, if there was a key one, but there were many, many players. You could have mentioned uh, guys like Roy Romano. You could have mentioned Lawrence Decor. You could have mentioned Walter Tarnopoisky. You could have mentioned uh, Manoli Lupul, etc. And Susk. They're the ones that really played the role. If it wasn't for those, the P's and P's and Seuss, if it wasn't for them, I don't know what would have happened. And number two, we got, um, I think that we pat ourselves on the back for multiculturalism. I don't think, in, I don't think there's one definition that, uh, I think we've got about 40 people here, I think there's 40 definitions of what multiculturalism means. When we got involved in this, I got involved in this for one reason. They did not accept Ukrainians. You know what? You know, they, like, like 
what it's turned into to be. Well, by and by, who were we? We weren't there. That's why we got organized, because we were shut out from coast to coast. That's exactly what happened. So um, I think that before we pat ourselves on the back, I think that like, because um, we now associate this with diversity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm not so sure. I mean, we got some benefits from it, but in the long run, this over diversity might be doing more harm to the country than than it's doing good. <laughs> uh, I have no comment. <laughs> 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 Uh, first of all, I have to commend you for uh, a very enlightening presentation. Uh, I always admire historians because of their ability to weave together a complex set of events and come up with a thread that does a pretty good job at explaining what comes next. But let me go back to my own experience. I mention this because my experience was very narrow. I grew up in the Niagara Peninsula in an area where the inhabitants, for the inhabitants, history had stopped with the War of 1812. They uh, had no idea that anybody in Canada, whether they were French or Hungarian or Ukrainian or anything else, had any right to progress or existence. Uh, immigrants were brought to Canada to be the laborers. And that view so seemed to have solidified to an idea that not only did the Im were the immigrants here to be laborers, but so were all their dependents forever into the future. Now, let me now weave this together with the point I want to make. It seems that politics is a kind of barometer of the inherited prejudices of the voters. And there were the forces that were at work in the multi in, in, in this era in which multiculturalism came to be seemed to be a desire by the French for uh, recognition and essentially to create France in Canada, a desire by the English to, to stop them, and a desire by everybody else to finally get to the point where there was no glass ceiling for their future. Now, what I would like you to comment on is how, you know, am I right in these powerful elements in Canadian politics, Absolutely. and how did they influence the creation of multiculturalism in Canada? Well, again, that's an enormous <laughs> question. Uh, I think, yes, <coughs> there were those three different pushes in uh, three different directions. Uh, but I think that um, uh, when, when the national crisis occurred in the 1960s with all the bombs and that sort of thing, and then, even later, with the, uh, with the October crisis in Quebec and the murder of Pierre Laporte and all that, the country was really faced with a crisis. There was a real crisis, a national crisis, and it was in danger of uh, breaking up. There's no doubt in my mind whatsoever. And anybody who goes back and reads the newspapers from those times, it's quite clear the danger was real and present. And there was an urgency uh, about this that uh, the government faced. And uh, Stephen Baker couldn't, couldn't do it. He couldn't handle it at all. He had no answers. He couldn't even answer the flag of it. He wanted to keep the old red ensign. You know? So he, he couldn't do it. Uh, the man who, who uh, really uh, engineered most of this was Pearson. Pearson was a moderate. He was a compromiser. He was always reaching out. He was a very respectful gentleman. He was respectful to, to, to anyone. And he's the one that, that phoned up uh, at Runitsky and said, please, I'd like you to sit in our commission. So, um, yes, there was that element. Um, and uh, it was answered. This crisis was answered. And the answer was a compromise. The compromise was uh, uh, multiculturalism in a bilingual framework. 
and it worked. It worked. The, the, uh, the federal government was changed into a bilingual institution. Um, its branches all over the country became bilingual. And of course, people complain you have to know some French to get a job with the government and all this. Even with the government of uh, Ontario now as well, and with uh, the government of uh, New Brunswick. So, and uh, the result of that was uh, a new confidence in French Canada, a new confidence that they could actually survive within Canada. <coughs> and this, I think, is quite clear today. Um, as to um, Canadian uh, non-charter groups, and this is a term that again arises during the constitutional break, didn't exist before that, just like bilingualism and biculturalism didn't exist before this debate. These are all new terms invented at this time. Um, Discrimination. Paul Hughes saw the discrimination, and he was fighting against it. That's what he wanted. He wanted to end that kind of discrimination, and he succeeded. He largely succeeded. And Ukrainians today are much less discriminated against than in the past. In fact, some, I've met many people who say they've never felt any discrimination at all. Younger people, not my parents' generation. My parents' generation was universal. It was universal, almost universal. Now it's it's, it's relatively rare. So there was success on that front as well. As to the English, um, the English uh, connection with Britain has diminished. Canada has become more self-sufficient. Canada has become an independent country. We no longer talk about the dominion of Canada as, the, as we did when I was a youth. Now it's just plain Canada. We no longer have Dominion Day as when I was a youth. We have Canada Day. All of this indicates a psychological change in the country that even the English have benefited from. So on all three fronts, I think there has been uh, manifold progress. And I think there's nothing wrong with being proud of, of, of what we've achieved over these, over these decades. Nothing wrong with it whatsoever. And I think we can stand proud among other countries in the world that this is in our constitution. It's not anywhere in, in, in English law, it's not anywhere in American law, it's not in Australian law, but it's in our Constitution. And that's an important thing to remember. Ще два питання максимально, бо вже починає бути пізнало. Чи є ще якісь питання? Прошу. Oh, so you got up first. <laughs> he, he's actually a superior okay. person, yeah. and he, he's also a, he's also a nature. <laughs> <laughs> right. so he's made his point. But my question is not about my uncle. Um, it's actually you sort of mentioned towards the end that um, how our native, or as they're called now, indigenous people seem to have more rights and everything. But I'm going back to 1963. What role do they have to play in the Bean Commission? Like, obviously, multi ethnic groups want to have some influence. <coughs> I'm like, six, any residential schools still existed, but today it's such a big deal about missing indigenous women, truth and reconciliation. Was there any role that they played at that time? Or did they want to? Um, indigenous peoples, um, or Indians as they were then called, were a subject of, uh, of discussion. They were not uh, prominent participants in these debates, but they were a subject of discussion. And uh, they benefited, they were the only people in Canada, actually, the, uh, the native peoples of Canada and the native peoples of, of the North in particular, benefited from Rudnitsky's votum separatum. They were the only groups to which constitutional rights were given as a result of the votum separatum. Not the Ukrainians, not the Germans, not the Italians, but the indigenous peoples of Canada benefited from Thank you very much for your talk. Um, as mentioned previously, uh, <clears throat> very, uh, uh, an excellent kind of synthesis of all the questions. Um, and please take this question not as a high inside fastball, but a hanging curve. The truth. We can't hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you speak up? Yeah, no, from a right hand. So <laughs> even easier. Now, um, in your uh, talk, you mentioned Italian Canadians and German Canadians. And it's interesting that uh, Finns, Chinese, Japanese, and other Canadians who, who definitely were 
to my knowledge, active in, in the process of uh, you know, synthesizing the idea of multiculturalism, appear not to have been on Professor Rudnitsky's radar. Or were they? Um, yes, they were. They were all on his radar. He was interested in all uh, linguistic minorities in Canada. Um, I'm not sure what more to say about it other than that. Um, oh, participation, fine. right? Participation. Okay. No. There, were no, there, there was no great finish to participation in this debate. Uh, I don't even know if they presented a brief. Uh, so far as I know, Finns in Canada at that time were still dominated by their pioneer immigration, uh, especially in the Lakehead, which was extremely left-wing. They were the second largest contributor to the Communist Party of Canada after the Ukrainians, the Finnish language uh, association. So um, they, they contributed to some things, but not to this particular debate. As to the Italians and the Germans, the Germans were in a difficult position. There had been two world wars fought with Germany, as a German-speaking uh, Austrian and, and Germany, uh, as the enemy. So um, there was discrimination against Germans in Canada. Um, in some ways, perhaps it was worse than discrimination against uh, Ukrainians. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but there was discrimination. And as a result, they had to keep a low profile. There is no way that they could lead the general ethnic movement in Canada. They had to keep a low They supported the Ukrainians, I think. Uh, on a personal level, in particular, I had a very good friend in Manitoba who was a leader of the Mennonite community there and told me that uh, he was a personal friend of Vernitsky. He admired Vernitsky enormously, and he admired what he did in the, in the Royal Commission and that sort of thing. So the, those were the Germans. The, the Italians, who were mostly living here in eastern Canada, in, in uh, uh, Toronto and in Montreal, those were the two biggest centers, said practically nothing during the entire debates. I don't even know if they presented a brief. Yes, they did. Well, they might have. Okay. We worked with them in Toronto for several years. Did they ever take a leadership role? No. Okay. And uh, my, my, uh, my suspicion there is that is that because they were a relatively new group in Canada, and they were primarily labor immigration. They didn't have the intelligentsia of the Ukrainians. And this is an important uh, uh, point, I think. The Ukrainians had a, a, a dedicated, a committed intelligentsia, transplanted from the old country. The DPs, the elite of the society, who were absolutely opposed to communism, were politically active, were experienced in politics, and pushed, and pushed hard. And they rely upon the older, uh, their constituency, their, their um, proletariat, if you were. It is the older immigration, much more numerous. But this small elite of well-educated, politically motivated people made a difference. I think that, that um, and yet they used the fact of the pioneers and their role in Canada as an argument for supporting Ukraine alliance in Canada. I think that's a relatively uh, fair to say that. This gentleman is experienced in this sort of thing. <laughs> Anyhow, that's it. Uh, thank you. Dr. Diakoyo, me oeni poyakorka našomu kopiritačare za požadu. Zapovesti, če je Kanadski institut ukrajinskih studij, bude vlaštovati dopovedj profesora Sergeja Jekelčuka z Univerzitetu Viktoriji. Vse bude tvoje pamjeć našo dobro prijatelja in znajomo vratu vas, Danilo Struka, to me več je Danilo Struk Memorial Act, Pač nakrat če Danilo Husar Struk, Memorial Lecture. In tema je The Last Debate with Stalin, Ukrainian writings, Writers in Moscow in 1929. Duže cikava tema to, što stalo se na peredodnji Holodomoru. Ko ovo ne perše 
провинцію винищу. Коли то є? Коли то є? 3 травня, в 7 годині вечір в Інституті Святого Володимира. Дякую.